Jai Krishna Murthy maintained that truth is a pathless land and one cannot approach it by any path whatsoever by any religion by any sect he said one should be a light to oneself and the moment one follows someone he ceases to follow truth alan watts also made it very clear that he was not a guru and called himself a spiritual entertainer Sadhguru adopts a different approach perhaps to reach as many people as possible however he admits that he takes his disciples for a ride enjoy the ride if you go to a teacher and ask for spiritual instruction or even if you come to a seminar like this you are by doing that confusing yourself because you are looking for what you're asking for outside as if someone else could give it to you as if you didn't have it so the teacher knows that as long as you do that you haven't understood but he doesn't just tell you to go away or we may sometimes Uh, just say go away i'm too busy and i'm any in any case i can't tell you anything well people won't take that for an answer they won't take no for an answer and furthermore if he just said go away they would just find some other teacher who would exploit them and uh, maybe keep them as followers for years and acquire a great deal of money by so doing what he does is another thing he tries to give them the put down as if to say you have a great long distance to go yet your attainment is uh, not at all perfect and uh where uh they they're always talking about other sects and other schools and saying well they haven't really got the point you see so that you keep losing faith in yourself and uh feeling my goodness i haven't yet attained this thing and that keeps you working but all the time you're being talked out it's like someone who's a pickpocket and he's stolen your own watch and is selling it to you but just so long as you can be talked out of yourself you deserve to be <laughs> now how do the question is how do i know whether i am being taken for a ride or not let's come directly to it <laughs> isn't it that's a question isn't it let me tell you you are being taken for a ride <laughs> because you are still not at in that stage where i can either expose or impose or even tell you what it is about it is like I don't know if you've seen but you come from a Asian family you might have seen in India especially mothers have a whole technology as to how to stuff the child with more food than you would normally eat you know <laughs> you know this <laughs> technology <laughs> now <laughs> 
they will take so much rice and whatever in the plate. The child says, no, this is too much, I am not going to eat that. So, okay, you eat one half of it. This half, as the child begins to eat, they'll mix everything together again. Let's say the child is eating half of this half, then they'll mix this thing together and then again make it… child says, no, it's too much, so again make it half. Okay, okay, only half I'll give you, again make it half. Like this they will go on doing and in the end, showing kakama, guvama, chandamama, this one, that one, you know, all kinds of distractions and unknowingly the child will eat up the whole plate full of rice. Definitely the mother is taking the child for a ride, isn't it? Yes? Similarly, the guru is also constantly taking his disciples or devotees for a ride because if you really tell them what they are supposed to swallow, they will just say this is impossible and they will run away. So because you like everything in installments, <laughs> I'm taking you for a ride in installments, but it will never happen in installments. It is whole or nothing. But your willingness comes in installments. Do you see, the first day you arrived at the introductory, what level of willingness you were and today what level of willingness you are, slowly we have taken you for a ride, isn't it? Making you little more willing, little more willing, little more willing. The way I am talking to you today, if I had spoken to you on that day, you would have left never to see my face again, isn't it so? So we are taking you for a ride <laughs>
it doesn't matter what happens, as long as we fulfil. But must we not even seek happiness? No. Happiness is a side effect. It's not an end in itself. No, but I mean, let's take happiness that does not depend upon anyone else's suffering. Let us, let us say that no one else is harmed. Uh, is it wrong then to seek happiness, a condition of happiness for ourselves, or indeed for others, for our loved ones? What do you mean by that word, happiness? Well, what, what the world means by it is, a, is, is an innocent pleasure, if you like. That's all. As long as one has pleasure, you call that happiness. Is pleasure love? Say, for instance, is love, desire, pleasure? Well, it's part of it, clearly. Ah, no, no. I mean, it is at the moment. It is well, as we, we see it, as we it. use we, it, as yes, we live we it. we accept yeah. that. Yes, we do. That's our human condition. Ah, right. We never break through it. So, what makes human beings throughout the world break, go, finish with all this? But why should we? I mean, after all, love, of man, we, love is one of the most. If, is it not? I mean, I, I want to. I want to know what you think about this. I'm not telling you, but is not love one of the most beneficial? It is aspects of mankind. But it's now identified with desire, mm -hmm. with pleasure, sex, fulfilment, a sense of fun, having fun in life. All that is called love. I think that's not love. What is? I think one can come to the realization of really what love and compassion, which is also with it goes intelligence, when we we'll discover what it is not. Mm. It's certainly not ambition. What about I can see the selfish ambition, the ambition to exert power over people. Power. But but what about the ambition to do good, to help uh, people? You do good. You, you, you're not ambitious to do good, then it becomes selfish. It's self-centred activity. You do good, finish. But we live in a world which depends on these things, don't so we? We live in a world that thought has created. Yes. We live in a world where we have given tremendous importance to thought. And thought has created all these problems. The atom bomb, wars, instruments of war, national divisions, religious divisions. But has it, it has indeed created those things, but has it not also created the good things oh, in yeah, the world yeah. also? I was going to say, surgery, surgery. medicine, art, art all the other things. Of course it has. But the most destructive part of thought is under which we are living. Wars, eternal wars. Mm -hmm. And nobody seems to be able to stop it. And nobody wants to stop it. Commercialism, you know, all the rest of it. don't have to go into all that. Well, then how can we stop it? And we'd better start, I suppose, with ourselves. Yes, that's all. How do we do that? After all, sir, sir, human consciousness is the consciousness of mankind. Mm -hmm. Right? It's not my consciousness or your consciousness. It's the consciousness of, of humanity. Yes. And the content of that consciousness is put there by thought. Greed, envy, ambition, uh, all the conflicts, misery, suffering, extraordinary sense of uh, isolation, loneliness, despair, anxiety, all that's there in our consciousness. Belief. I believe in God. I, I believe in this. So faith and belief at, brings about atrophy to the, at, to the brain. But do you, do you reject belief itself? Oh, yes. Do you? Completely. Because if you... Look... You don't uh, leave much standing, do you, Krishna? Huh? You don't leave much standing, do of you, Krishna? Of course not. They, that's what I said. 
one has to be free of all the illusions that thought has created to see something really sacred which comes about through right meditation. And how right meditation? Yeah. And what is right meditation? You suggest that there is also a wrong meditation. Oh, all the meditations that are being put forward now by the gurus and all the rest of it is nonsense. Why? Because first you must put the house in order. But isn't this the way to put the ah, house in order? You see, that's wrong. They think by meditating you put the house in order. Yes. No? no. Not so? No. On the contrary, you must put the house in order. Which is house, you understand? Yes. House in order. Then from otherwise if you don't you it becomes an escape. But we need surely to escape from the from the ego, from the self, from these desires, these demands in ourselves. Surely the silence of meditation is a valuable path to that, isn't it? You see, please, the question of meditation is very complex. Unless one puts the house in order, which is no fear, the understanding of pleasure, the ending of sorrow, from that arises love, compassion, intelligence. And the, the process to that, we'll call it a process for the moment, is part of meditation. And then, whether to find out whether thought can ever stop, which is time, has, a, has to have a stop. And then, when then out of that comes the great silence. It's in that silence alone that one can find that which is sacred.